Good afternoon, everyone. I was just plugging in my phone. Um, my name is John Bracken. I have the pleasure of talking to you from Chicago, Illinois, as the executive director of the Digital Public Library of America. Uh, um, I am going to speak slowly because one of the reasons that the Digital Public Library of America is 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 logging in as we speak, Bob Darton, uh, one of our founders, um, not so long ago, um, and my joy is to introduce him but in, as i speak slowly i also want to thank um first cat williams from the dpla staff who who is the executive producer and originator of this conversation um, um and jenny lee who is always hard to introduce a former dpla board member a a, a publisher a filmmaker uh, a an activist for quality information and against misinformation. Um, and those are only a couple of her hats. Democracy is one of her hats. Um, Jenny has, has they gratefully uh, agreed to help be our interlocutor today with, with Richard. Um, and, and I guess the other person I want to acknowledge is our mutual friend, Vickery Bowles at Toronto Public Library, who in one of our more recent um, uh, conversations as a community mentioned this book and mentioned some of the um, the impact and the waves that the conversation of Richard's book had had inside of both inside of the staff of Toronto Public Library and with and with the community there. Um, so I am going to take the plunge and see if I can pass the microphone to our colleague and friend Bob Darton, and if not. Um, I'll hand it over to, to Jenny or Richard to get us started. Bob, do you have a microphone? All right. Well, should we hand it, Richard? Should we hand it over to you and 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 jump into the to the conversation? Or or sure. I, I'm um, if you can hear me, I'm ready to go. So. I just want to say that for some reason we've lost your screen share. Okay, let's try and Pop do that, that again. Um, does that come back? Yes, that looks great. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, colleagues, thank you for inviting me to join the Digital Public Library of America this evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you. Um, uh, in the lockdown, I published a book um, expressing my um, historical, both my historical interest in the history of libraries and archives, um, but with a particular current concern. And that was um, really driven by a number of factors. And one of those was visiting Berlin um, in 2018 for a meeting in the Staatsbibliothek. And, I was slightly early and stumbled upon the sea, the, the location where the events that are on the screen, I hope you can see um, that took place 90 years ago last week. So, or, or the week before last, the 22nd of May, uh, 1933, uh, at an organized mass book burning that took place in Berlin, organized by Joseph Goebbels for the Nazi party, with books from Jewish libraries and bookshops and from the library of an Institute for Human Sexuality. And uh, those events, it struck me as I was walking around this location, there's a very moving plaque um, there now commemorating these events. And it struck me that this wasn't actually very long ago. Um, my mother, who's still alive, was alive when this mass book burning took place. And of course, it was a cultural genocide that prefigured a human genocide. And I, I, I felt that we shouldn't think of this as being a, a distant historical event, that this was actually the um, uh, a historical event that still resonated today. Um, but the real kind of trigger for it was um, in the heat of the UK government's uh, immigration policy known as the hostile environment to give you a flavor of its character, um, uh, which in 2018 dominated political events in the UK, 
um, for many months, that it became clear that the pressure that was being our fellow citizens were being put on to prove their right to remain in the UK or their right to settled status, um, that a very peculiar event took place. And that event was the destruction of an archive of documents that those same citizens could have used to, to prove their right to settled status. But the same government department that destroyed this archive of documents was actually the same government department who was um, instigating and pursuing the hostile environment, this very aggressive um, uh, Im and immigration policy. And that event struck me as a perfect example of the social importance of the preservation of knowledge and of the role of li libraries and archives as institutions that society has um, geared to preserve knowledge uh, and to share it on, on society's behalf. And so I wrote an op-ed in the Financial Times um, uh, highlighting this, and, and the book really essentially came out of that, of that op-ed. And the book in itself is not so much about the destruction of knowledge, but about the social value of preserving knowledge. And as a historian, I took a kind of historical view going back to um, uh, the first libraries that we know about, or uh, some of the earliest ones in the ancient libraries, uh, the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia, where there are uh, there's uh, an amazing amount of information about those libraries and archives um, through archaeological digs, um, but also the the the, so the myth of the so-called um, destruction of the Library of Alexandria, which, um, uh, I, I, and again, I, I had grown up thinking of this, um, you know, event, the destruction of the Library of Alexandria having been a single historical moment, but actually modern scholarship now feels that there was no such moment, that the Library of Alexandria declined over many decades, if not centuries, and as a result of the uh, of really underfunding of of state priorities changing it, it the, the the ancient library of alexandria was founded as an example of state prestige and state patronage and state funding in this case royal funding albeit but that um over centuries it moved from having been um the most famous the most important library in the ancient world to one where um, the ancient writers could not agree over the reasons why it faded to nothing. To, uh, and today, you know, scholars argue about the actual location in the city of Alexandria where this um, great library, this massive collection of knowledge uh, had been. And so that example to me of to the modern age is actually one of, of neglect. Um, and um, I, I look at events in the Reformation, for example. This is a photograph I took on the site of the Library of Glastonbury Abbey, one of the great religious houses um, in Britain in the Middle Ages. But its library, which we actually know quite a lot about through um, archives, um, actually some of them here in the Bodleian Library where I'm the, the director, um, uh, we know that the library on the eve of the Reformation was probably about two and a half thousand volumes, and today there are only 60 that, that survive. And that's actually true of the medieval library of the University of Oxford, which the Bodleian is essentially the successor, founded in 1320. Uh, the building is still there. It moved in the middle of, in the beginning of the 15th century to a new location. And again, the room is still there, but the, but the books that um, were stored and the services that ran from that room were cut short in 1549 and 1550 during the second most brutal phase of the, um, the Reformation in England. And uh, the books were had their pages torn out and uh, reused as waste for book binders or used by pie makers to line pie dishes, soap sellers to wrap soap in. Um, and the phrase at the time was that books were dog cheap and whole libraries could be had for an inconsiderable nothing. Um, but actually, the, uh, this destruction prompted an act of renewal and um, uh, rebuilding of the library that 
um, Sir Thomas Bodley, whom the library is now named after, took upon himself, even though he was a Protestant, he regretted the loss of knowledge during the Reformation and um, set up his the, the, the refounded institution, um, which um, he did at the very tail end of the 16th century, to be deliberately arranged to preserve and share knowledge as widely as possible. And that's a theme um, essentially that I came back to looking at the destruction of the Library of Congress in, in the United States at the hands of, of, of British forces in, in 1814. And there's the Library of Congress has this um, absolutely astonishing mezzo tint of the, the perpetrator of the, the burning of the Library of Congress, uh, Admiral Coburn. And you can see uh, those events unfolding in the mezzo tint in the background of the portrait. Uh, but again, um, it prompted an act of renewal, of um, renewed interest, a renewed focus um, um, in, in the form of the library of Thomas Jefferson, the private library of Jefferson being um, not gifted, but sold at, at very favorable rates to the government to replenish the lost library. And this theme I come, uh, I, I come back to through the book, through historical episodes, um, including in the Holocaust in the city of Vilna, the capital of Lithuania. Uh, now, we now know it as Vilnius, uh, a library, uh, a, a city full of libraries and archives on the eve of the Holocaust, um, including a major archival institution called YIVO, which was dedicated to preserving um, uh, records of the everyday life of Jewish people in Central and Eastern Europe. But of course, the Nazis, um, in waging their um, uh, attack on the Jewish people, um, formed an operational group um, under um, the leadership of a man called Johannes Poole, who had been a librarian in the State Library of Berlin, but was seconded to um, uh, the rather perverted research institute led by Alfred Rosenberg, one of the chief architects of anti-Semitism in Frankfurt, and this operational group went to the cities that fell in Central and Eastern Europe to the uh, at, at the two German forces during Operation Barbarossa, and targeted libraries and archives for either bringing back to the Frankfurt Institute or for destruction. And they uh, identified Jewish librarians and archivists in the ghettos of the cities like Vilna um, to go back and sort through their own collections to decide what should be preserved and what should be destroyed. And those things that were preserved were actually sent away to Frankfurt, uh, to the, the, the kind of epicenter of anti-Semitism. So an appalling task that those individuals were forced to do at gunpoint. But they, um, in Vilna, they were soon dubbed the Paper Brigade by the Nazi guards, and they decided to try to preserve as much of this heritage, this documentary and literary heritage as they possibly could by smuggling pages, uh, books and documents back into the ghetto um, e each evening. And they hid them in the ghetto in the hope that some of them might survive, or at least these rescued collections would survive um, uh, the horrible events that unfolded. And a similar activity happened in Warsaw with uh, an amazing group called Oineg Chabes, led by an equally amazing individual called Emmanuel Ringelblum. His collections were found um, in milk churns and metal canisters at, at, at the end of, end of the war, even though Ringelblum and his colleagues were all murdered um, at the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, the collections in Frankfurt, in the library of Rosenberg's uh, awful research institute, were recovered by American troops, and they, the, a, a huge effort then began to return them to the uh, communities of, of origin, including um, here the, an, outbroach, uh, an outpost of the YIVO Institute in New York, and you can see the New York staff of YIVO unpacking this amazing uh, trove of material rescued from uh, from the Frankfurt Institute. But in, um, in back in Vilna, in Lithuania, the collections that the paper brigade had hid in the Vilna ghetto um, were, were uncovered um, when German troops were pushed out by the Soviet army, together with a few of the members of the paper brigade who had escaped 
at the time that the Vilna ghetto was liquidated and joined the partisans in the forest. So they recovered all these uh, documents that they had that, that they had carefully hidden, re-established the institute only to find it fell foul of Soviet ideology and the documents were sent again uh, a second time to the paper mills for destruction. This time, uh, a Lithuanian librarian called Antonas Ulpis, he's the man on your screen, um, turned the, the trucks around and hid them in an outpost of the National Library of Lithuania, um, uh, where they remained a secret. They were hidden, including in the organ pipes of the church, the disused church in which um, uh, uh, Ulpis was in control, uh, until 1989, until the fall of the, uh, of the, of the Berlin Wall. Um, and that they're today being digitized by the Yivo Institute and the National Library of Lithuania. But these events of destruction, again, are, uh, you know, are still happening today, including um, in, in recent years, you know, again, less than 30 years ago um, in Bosnia, where uh, in uh, 1992, the National Library of Bosnia and Herzegovina was targeted by Serb militia with incendiary shells, um, which um, no other building was targeted that day. This is deliberate destruction, deliberate attempts to erase cultural memory in Bosnia, including the, the firefighters and librarians who tried to rescue collections from the burning building were targeted by snipers. And that kind of activity happened across Bosnia and, uh, and Kosovo at the time. Um, I, I'm going to just very briefly um, end my talk by talking about five reasons which I uh, put uh, in a coda at the end of my book why libraries and archives are uh, um, important um, for society to preserve uh, and to um, sustain. And um, I've been actually, since the book was published, I've been thinking more about the role that libraries and archives play as part of the infrastructure for democracy. And that's um, these five reasons um, uh, are, are what I'm going to talk about for just in the last few minutes. So the first of these is pretty obvious one. It's about education. It's about giving uh, communities and society opportunities to educate themselves in a, in, a, in a kind of level playing field where people are given equal access to information, uh, equal access to knowledge, um, and where money doesn't need to, to change hands in order for people to get access um, to uh, knowledge resources for um, their own education and for their children or for communities. Um, but we see um, those continued attacks to, to deny the ability of education um, in, for example, um, in 2021, when Afghanistan fell to Taliban rule, uh, the libraries that had been set up in the previous decade um, in order to support the education of communities, particularly, for example, for uh, young women, were among the first institutions to be attacked and destroyed um, when during the Taliban takeover. And again, I wrote about that um, in uh, an essay in the Financial Times. Uh, the second reason to support libraries and archives um, uh, is about the di a diversity of knowledge being uh, made available through those institutions, and, and not just a linguistic diversity, but a diversity of ideas. And again, we can see um, that idea of diversity being um, directly challenged in America at the moment. I don't need to talk to you about this. You're living it at the moment. And our colleagues in the library sector in many states of the United States having to uh, defend their right to make uh, a diversity of knowledge available to their patrons, to the communities which those libraries serve. And the, the uh, extreme attempts that are being made to uh, stop libraries from performing this function is a sign of the value, I think, that those services are providing to those uh, communities. It's a kind of perverted um, uh, 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 evidence of recognition, I guess, of the quality or the importance of that, of that function. And, uh, and again, just echoing those earlier attempts, those earlier um, renew, acts of renewal and uh, re-emphasis of libraries that I 
um, sort of plotted through my book. You see that again with the uh, you know amazing work being done by institutions like the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Public Library to make um, those banned collections available via the internet and and, and a myriad of other means. The the challenges. Um, the legal challenges from the library community as it's been organizing uh, to, to fight back against the, the, the book bans and the attempts to defund the library sector. So absolutely, uh, I see a very strong historical tradition for this. Uh, and uh, again, absolutely amazing work. The third of those uh, five reasons is about the rights of citizens being preserved um, in libraries and archives. And you can see that, for example, in the, um, the work that the Harvard Law Library did to identify um, uh, preservation issues around the website of the US Supreme Court in 2011 and the, 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 the massive uh, problems of link rot in that, in, in, in that website and the, the consequent uh, uh, fantastic work that's been done to be able to um, uh, make you know, legal information available to the citizens of, of the country, or the um, heroic efforts that were made um, at the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 by German citizens to stop the Stasi from destroying the files uh, on themselves, on their own citizenry. And the, 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 the institute that was set up to enable citizens to have access to their own Stasi file, which my colleague Timothy Gartnash here in Oxford um, wrote about in his amazing book called The, the File, which I, I, I really kind of commend to you. Um, the fourth reason I, I put forward is libraries and archives as reference points for facts and truth. And in an age of disinformation and misinformation, there's no stronger reason, I think, for supporting the work of libraries and archives uh, than this. And you can also see this in the, um, the way that the, you know, the mass platforms for knowledge creation and sharing, and particularly social media, uh, go through their um, paroxysms in their business models and in their operational models. We've seen that with Twitter in the last few months. Um, uh, and of course, you know, preservation of knowledge is not something that's in the business models of those uh, organizations. But we've seen, again, libraries making, you know, really important efforts to try to, um, uh, you know, preserve those public statements that are made on their platforms, like the National Library of New Zealand's Facebook archiving project. Um, and again, in, in my country, the fate of information uh, sharing made by government ministers during the pandemic using um, private communications channels like WhatsApp is right, you know, this week at the heart of uh, political debate and, and controversy in this country. And I've argued elsewhere that uh, this calls for the um, you know, those digital messaging systems to be brought under the control, under the purview of the Public Records Act and considered as public, public records. And, um, uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, there was a very interesting article in the Telegraph of India where, um, again, misinformation was being circulated for political reasons uh, by Hindu nationalists who had taken the doctoral thesis of a prominent um, uh, academic in India, uh, an Oxford doctoral thesis, and had completely doctored it to alter his views and to circulate that online. And of course, um, we have the original thesis, it's available online on our, on our website, um, and we've been trying to sort of counteract that disinformation by pointing to the verifiable, preserved, um, citable original. Um, and of course, you, you you know, there's no better example than um, you, your former President Trump um, and his use of, of, of deletion for his public statements on, on the medium of Twitter. The final of my reasons is um, for the supporting libraries and archives is the role they play in preserving and um, celebrating identity of um, society as a whole, of communities, um, of individuals, 
And um, you can see that in Ukraine at the moment, where um, uh, Ukrainian um, culture is being attacked alongside the uh, the, the, the the military targeting uh, libraries and archives in Ukraine are being targeted. And I, I wrote about that recently um, in The Atlantic. Um, and I'd just like to uh, end this period, I've slightly overrun, um, apologies for that, with this quote from Orwell, um, which really kind of sums up um, the, 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 the historical moment that we're in, um, particularly with the, um, uh, you know, the place of digital information at the moment. And uh, wearing another hat, I chair, I, I, I'm the president of the, Di the Digital Preservation Coalition uh, based in the UK. Um, and I think this just kind of sums up the, the place that we're in at the moment. Thank you. Sorry, that was a very rapid counter. Shall I take my slides down? Yeah, I think you can take them down now. Thank you, Richard. And Jenny's going to take over here. Oops, Jenny, you're still muted. Thank you. That's like probably the most mentioned thing ever on uh, Zoom. You're on mute. Um, so uh, one thing that really struck me in reading through your book was how many people risk their personal safety and even their lives for preserving knowledge. So um, I think in the in the in the Sarajevo case, did the head of the museum or were they actually killed by a grenade blast in trying to like trying to preserve um but do a protective sheet over over something yeah, like yeah. in the in the national in the mm -hmm. national museum that that's right and actually several librarians were were murdered by sniper fire including one librarian from the national library of bosnia um in sarajevo on the day um of the day of the shelling ada butarovic was her name and she was uh targeted by serb snipers as she'd been involved in trying to um, rescue collections from the burning building. And I'm I'm wondering what your thoughts on like what drives these individuals to put the personal safety and lives at risk for the preservation of knowledge and archives. It's very striking because it's like throughout, you know, the paper. I, I, absolutely. Absolutely. It is striking. I and mean, you know, it's it's <sighs> It's something in deep in human nature, I think, and it particularly when collections are witnesses, you know, that that fifth of my reasons, that bit about cultural identity, where library and archival collections are witnesses, they are the, um, the entities that preserve that culture. When that happens, people will be willing to you know, they'd be willing to do anything to preserve it. They're absolutely driven to do that, and and also driven to to recover it, to to you know renew that that um, that function, um, and and not just the collections themselves, but the services that those um, institutions provide. You see that in Ukraine, where there are many librarians, you know, still on the front line, still in those, um, you know sandbagging their collections, maintaining library services, taking books into the bomb the bomb shelters, serving um, you know communities on the front line with knowledge, with schools, you know, amazing work. I agree. I almost feel like we should create like some in in, in journalism, for example, we have a lot of prizes for people who risk their lives for or you know put that put themselves at risk. And I almost feel like we should create if, if there isn't already one for librarians, I feel like we collectively I, should create. I think one. we should. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um and, and, and I just like to I, I mean I you know from um you know some of the some of the conversations I've had with American librarians right now, um, some of the librarians in states where there is very strong targeting of libraries that they feel very um threatened that they've they've had death threats that you know so this is not again this is not something that is a historical phenomenon this is something that's happening right now very much so and the what's also striking at least in the library of alexandria which i did not know you know as you mentioned it's a myth that ver it's the, the difference between how a, a, a library or archives can be deliberately targeted for destruction in a very active way versus um, bureaucratic, they, they can die by bureaucratic rot that through 
uh, being unfunded and being just sort of like starved of resources. And we're, you know, as, as you mentioned, this is not a historical phenomenon. This is also something we're seeing very much now as you see public services being starved by uh, the people who control the government purse strings. And, yeah. and um, as you say, I think it, it, it reflects the emotional health of society, whether or not it, it it's or it sort of is a, a leading indicator when the libraries and the archives are dying, that sort of is an indicator of the general health of the, whether or not it's society or democracy or whatnot. And I, I thought that was a very interesting point as well. I, 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 I mean, it's amazing when you think that, you know, there are many ancient writers who write about the scale of the library, its fame, how scholars came to work in the museum, this temple of the muses that was attached to the library, and which is where we get the modern concept of museum from. Uh, and this drew famous scholars, you know, Euclid's, Elements of Geometry was written, Archimedes, you know, these, these were amazing scholars who worked in the library with the knowledge there. So its fame was throughout the ancient world. And yet within several centuries, it was gone. And then you find scholars later debating, well, what happened to all the papyrus scrolls? Oh, I know, they were used to light the fires that, you know, that, um, warm the baths. So it, it doesn't take very many generations to move from this thing where something is world famous and, and enabling the creation of knowledge that we still utilize today. I mean, you know, Euclid's Elements of Geometry is still considered a foundational text of modern mathematics. <laughs> but um, so this is a real lesson for us. You know, in my country, we've lost. Um, you know, almost a thousand libraries in the last uh, public libraries in the last ten years. I mean, this is this is this is not just a tragedy, but it's shameful. And you know, there are many local communities that are fighting back every time this happens. But uh, you know, part of the motivation for me writing the book was to try to get a broader audience to recognize this as a problem and hopefully be outraged by it. And so one of the the other terms I had never heard of um, until I read your book is sort of along these ideas, which is, you know, there are archives that are very systematic and official and part of the government infrastructure, but there are also people who like take it upon themselves to start doing archival uh, work kind of outside the official system. So the Internet Archive, I think, is one that you bring up. And um, in the context of archival activism, and I'm kind of struck by... <coughs> The fact that you know, in some in some ways, are more nimble, so they can act faster than large things that are funded by government bureaucracy or or university kind of bureaucracy. But at the same time, they're not necessarily don't have the same kind of longevity <laughs> for the world because you know the same thing that gives them the nimbleness is also what what kind of doesn't give them sort of the long time horizon. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've talked to, obviously, I've talked to Brewster many times and uh, his colleagues at, at the Internet Archive. And I just, you know, I'm I'm a huge fan, as you, anyone who reads the, the that section of my book will, will discover. But, um, and, and they've reassured me that, you know, their board is, that they put in place is now, um, you know, a, a, a real kind of solid issue about trying to address the, the enduring nature of that organization. But I, I, I think throughout history, the history of libraries and archives, you know, there are some which have managed to survive a very, very long time. And I think that sort of emphasis on longevity is balanced against the erosion of the, the smaller institutions that we find. And I think it's an issue, it's not a simple one, to solve that our community, our industry, if you like, must, must look to. Um, but that, you know, those issues about sustainability, the association with libraries and archives, with institutions that have, you know, been around for a very long time. Um, you know, I've always been interested in the Long Now Foundation and, you know, trying to think about you know, knowledge alongside other activities that um, decisions that were made a very long time ago have an impact still, you know, hundreds of years, hundreds of years later, if not thousands of years later. And I think, 
I, you know, I'm definitely one of these people who, who who feels that we should try to get away from this kind of short termism in our public planning, in our civic life, and and and, and start thinking of hopefully in longer time horizons. Although the the climate crisis kind of <laughs> challenges that notion somewhat. Um, I'm going to weave in one of the questions from the Q&A. So, so on the topic of, you know, internet archive and just digital archives in general, given the increasingly effective ability for digital rec records to be hacked and therefore modified, yeah. which is interesting, um, what is being done to sort of prevent that, or at least kind of say this is the the canonical version, you know, of something at, at that time? And, and that's not just, you know, from a a malicious perspective. I, I do feel like if you archive a, a web page at a certain time, you know, it can change just very naturally in, you know, in in a week or a month. And so you kind of have to do this this very much yeah. this sort of continual yeah. archive. Yeah. Especially governments. I, I, absolutely. Well, th there's no one single answer to that question. I think it's a kind of range of approaches, a range of um, strategies that we have to deploy and continue to work on because this is not a kind of static field. The technology changes, the 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 you know the 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 the, the tech industry changes, the players in the tech industry change a lot of the time. So on the one hand, you have kind of technologies like the blockchain. On the other, you have you know actually much more simple ideas like locks. And clocks where the you know the multiplication of um you know preserved copies that idea of redundancy um still has a a, a great value um and, and then you know the whole movement around permanent identifiers um or just you know the frequent archiving of websites and those kind of date stamps and the other kind of preservation uh, methodologies that you put in place to um, ensure that that frequency of change itself can be tracked and, and and captured. And I think this is where actually AI can be the librarians and the archivists and, and society's friend in being able to, um, you know, kind of monitor and, 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 and track that as well as obviously it being a threat. I think there's an opportunity there as well as the threat. Um, in terms of so, so something in terms of the the in terms of digital archiving, the volume is simply immense. Just everything from obviously everything is coming through Twitter. The fact that the Library of Congress in the United States started archiving, but then that in, at a certain point became overwhelming given the resources that they were handed. I'm um, you bring up an interesting concept in um, in your book about like a memory tax. That maybe the places that we can, maybe the places to go get resources from are yeah. the very large companies that are helping us generate all of this, you know, yeah. um, user content. Yes. And I, I, I mean, the number you proposed I thought was a little bit aggressive, which was I think half a percent um, of profits. But I was just wondering if you can speak to like what the thinking has been around that. Um. So, well, uh, on the scale issue, there's there's. You know, we've here in Oxford, we've got the great Harvard scholar um, Bob Danton's successor in the Fort Simon chair, Anne Blair, talking. And I don't know if you know her book too much to know about the um, the Renaissance idea that there was so much information that it was just kind of overwhelming. And mm -hmm. of course, we're we're rediscovering that sense in society at the moment. So I get asked a lot. Oh, there's so much you can't archive everything, can you? Is good, you know, kind of. Uh, and the kind of um, one of the implications of that is so why bother at all? Um, so the first thing I'd say is that archivists are used to dealing with knowledge at scale and they're used to techniques, approaches like sampling that can equally be applied to digital information. So I, I, I don't think this is anything new. Anne Blair tells us that in her book um, and archivists who've been working with knowledge at scale know this for real. Um, so I think we can apply those techniques to the internet and we can apply technologies like AI to actually help us do that. On the public policy question, 
so um, you know, I've I've I, I, I put this forward actually first in a book review in the Financial Times um, a few years ago, um, but also I've repeated it in the Economist and elsewhere that you know the preservation of digital information is of fundamental importance for society, and I think we see that there are so many use cases now that it you know you, it, it's not very difficult to argue this. Um, and given that we've alre al already been talking about the funding challenges that the sector faces, so, you know, we have the legacy of the past, the analog past that we cannot avoid pre preserving, that we shouldn't avoid preserving, and we have the digital present and the digital future to deal with as well simultaneously. So we've got, we've got a kind of a, a, a double problem. And I think, um, you know, wearing my digital preservation coalition hat, we have approaches, we have the tech, you know, we have the technology, we have the organization, we're good at collaborating. So the main limiting factor here is funding. So to me, we all see the obscene profits that some of the players in the industry are making why not tax them okay so you can argue over the level <laughs> but why why not try to approach that um through uh, a levy on the profits that are made in the industry to go back um to the sector that society has chosen to support them through preserving knowledge in digital form and I've, I've, I, I have started to have, you know, this idea has been picked up by a couple of civil servants here. I've been talking to them about this in the UK. Um, you know, I, I just think we need to be, as a community, as an industry, more aggressive, more angry, more public about the challenges that we face and how we need to address them. Yeah, and you know, it'd be really interesting whether or not it, it is because large companies can move profits back and forth between their international. Of course they can. And so it'd be really interesting yeah. if one one state starts to one country starts doing it and they start uh <laughs> they start doing their little um the little shell game to move things around. But yeah. um Bob Darton, I think, is here and I will call him and what my my tiny story um where my world and Bob's world overlaps so if he's ready to speak is I just had my 25th reunion. Um college reunion which is at harvard and one of the things that they they do they we they generally do not let us do this in in um in normal times is the widener library actually has a room where um, it has your most of the original books that harry widener's family donated after he died in the titanic and um it's usually roped off in this like stand stanchion thing but for the 25th reunion they actually let us go go into the room and they have a one of the gutenberg bibles um and i hear rumors that there's also a first folio though that is not on display so it was, it was actually very cool to like not just like you know kind of peek your nose over the rope but actually be able to walk in through through the room so that was uh lovely and um i don't know if bob wants to say anything at this point or i can there are many lovely questions also in the the chat but bob whenever you feel um like it's a good time you can you can chime in but one of the questions that that are that's here that intersects my world um both as a former dpla member board member and also a lot of the work that i do on uh, misinformation is what is a responsible way for libraries to effectively collect and preserve propaganda and misinformation such as holocaust denial denial literature or you know vaccine misinformation in a responsible ways so i think this is uh, that's a great question. Thank you for it. I think it's so important that we preserve this material. Um, and the, the key to it is about uh, metadata. It's about marking that material, identifying it for what it, what it is or what it was, so that you have a kind of a permanent, authentic, verifiable record of that piece of misinformation and you can then track its um its 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 use and reuse kind of like you see quotations from 
the protocols of the elders of Zion. So, you know, copies of that text need to be preserved so that you can see where it is being used and where the sources of that misinformation come back to. And so all of, uh, but also it's about holding individuals or organizations to account because they will also deny that they ever said such okay. a thing. And so being able to preserve those ephemeral, ephemeral messages, whether that's in WhatsApp or Signal or whatever, um, Parler, whatever platform is being used, enables society to hold their public officials or other individuals to account. It's about evidence. And that evidence is at the heart of what libraries and archives must be doing in the, in the misinformation place. And it's about the kind of core skills that we have about metadata, about provenance of information, and about recording those things uh, as part of the preservation service. And along these lines, given everyone that's on this call, um, so what can we as individuals, information professionals and scholars do to fight back against the destruction of information and truth? Um, you know, and this is all uh, along all the dimensions that um, and fronts that are currently battlegrounds at this point. Okay, so I think there's a, there's a big range uh, of things. Um, the, the first is about public awareness. So, you know, can you do social media or web or in-person talks, exhibitions, um, blog posts, social media posts about the, the, the challenges that the misinformation era poses to society and the ways in which libraries and archives can support society? So that kind of advocacy and public awareness is, is a big part of it. There's organization and collaboration. So um, being able to work together across state boundaries, national boundaries, to, because it's not something that one individual institution faces. We all face it. We're all facing the same problem. So can we work together, share best practice, share the toolkit that we are um, that, that, that we we develop in order to be able to fight back? Actually do things, you know, write a grant proposal, you know, do projects that um, you know, test some of these things out. Actually, you know, join clocks, do, you know do whatever you can in a kind of practical way um, it, uh, uh, and, until those tax dollars start rolling in um, <laughs> um, it, it, in, in order to um, make inroads on the on the on the scale of the of the problem but I think it's it's not there isn't one single thing there's a whole range of things from from advocacy through to kind of organization and um, collaboration through to you know practical projects and um, developing services um, because you know we all we all have to play our part and along those lines <clears throat> do you consider the digitization of archives and libraries currently as something that is essential or important to fight the false information um, the sort of swirling around these days is yeah, it is I, that misinformation can or the library is saying that i i tend to think it is uh, uh but i think it has to be done in full knowledge that um it will just like putting that um scholars doctoral thesis online on our website enabled it to be manipulated by bad actors in the you know in the cultural and political debates in India. Um, I, I think we have to do it in a way that enables that verifiability, that preservability, that citability, so that we can always point back to the authentic, trusted 
original, whether that's online or on a shelf in a book stack. That's one of the core functions in this, this kind of bouillabaisse of information that is, you know, is now circulating all around us to, to, to that we can be solid, dependable, verifiable, um, trustworthy sources of information and auth and authentic knowledge. So, um, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm rambling a bit here. I'm going off piste. Um, what was the question? Remind me of the question. Well, and I can also, um, actually, we have an interesting question that that's sort of, that that's related and actually very much practically um, something I'm, I'm sort of dealing with. So in terms of, you know, there's this idea of marking this information in the metadata, but there's also something that's an adjacent issue um, that DPLA is de dealing with, I'm dealing with in a tiny way, which is that there are, in historic collections, there's often things that in our eyes today would seem very outdated or potentially harmful. And this, we we want to make the harmful, you know, the, the, this information available because it is historically relevant, but it is it is a little bit dicey. And I have my my small examples. Um, we have a short story catalog that we were building, you know, with all uh, over time called Writing Atlas. And there's a story from Flannery O'Connor that I think is um, we were we're indexing it, and it's called it's called artificial, and then like the N word, and we were like, oh, like <laughs> what do we do about that? Because it it is the story as it was published, um, and it is that title, but it is something that I think if we put it into our index, would in at least this time and day uh, be offended. So we were like, do we not put the story up? Do we kind of basically just kind of use asterisk, or, you know, or 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 do you use a real name? And I don't know if this is something that you have also dealt with in your librarian capacity, but it is something that is, you know, relevant yeah. to us, DPLA, and probably many people on this call. Yeah. Um, I don't have an easy answer to that one. It's not something that we've directly faced, um, but I can see it happening. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, I, I tend to think that... Um, you, you know, at our heart, our institution should be about preserving knowledge, whether it's uncomfortable or comfortable. That's interesting. Okay. And so that's at, at, at a core thing. You know, this was a fact that people said these things and used those words, you know, as horrible as it, that was. That is a kind of fact. And I think the preservation of that fact with the appropriate warnings safeguards and so on is important because you know we we need to know these things we need to face those kind of realities in order to kind of respond to them uh, and, and partly to to show how it can be done better yeah okay. and, and 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 to repudiate some of the views you know you can take an extreme example like mine can now um you know, I happen to think we need to have copies of Mein Kampf in libraries, um, partly because actually it may be difficult for individuals to go in a bookshop and say, can you order me a copy of Mein Kampf <laughs> or to do it on Amazon? I, I, mean, I, I was talking to Shoshana Zuboff about this thing, and she was saying that some of her graduate students didn't want to to order copies of Mein Kampf on Amazon, even though it was required reading for one of their courses, because they felt that that, that knowledge would be shared with right-wing groups and they would be targeted with, with propaganda right. and so on. So actually libraries should be places where this kind of information with the right metadata, with the right safe, kind of safeguarding information around it, with the right warnings, should be accessible and i think actually needs to be accessible right so sort of the con and to, to answer uh or to, to sort of digest what you're saying it, and this is like i said something we're dealing with it's to give the right context and even maybe some insight into the deliberation of why you chose to or we chose to make something available as is because it is a historical archive and it should be you know truthful to that time but to understand that we see it in the context of today and that we're sensitive, sensitive. Yeah. Yep. Um, also for many of the people on, on this call, uh, they're curious, you know, are there best practices to um, document and, and or are there, sorry, are there best practices to help school and public libraries 
fight the book bans and censorship movements that are kind of sweeping across definitely the United States, probably um, many places beyond, like what can they do on an individual level? So I've certainly seen um, kind of toolkits being produced. I think the, actually the ALA has one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and it, it may be that I've seen another in one of the states, possibly Louisiana, um, where librarians have been kind of sharing, you know, a kind of what to do list of things um, to do. Um, uh, and I'll, 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 I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I, I'm, I'm certainly kind of uh, uh, aware of, of, I've certainly be, seen some of those things online. Here we go. Yeah. Unite Against Book Bans Freedom. So there are a couple of groups that have been very active and very um, good at organizing um, some of these things, um, you know, those toolkits. Yeah. F freedom is, an, is another. Unite Against Book Bans. So there's, 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 there's two or three of them. Um, indeed. Okay. The, another... Um, question this is sort of a, a question for in the audience for something that we, we we spoke about earlier which is this idea the of the destruction of library about the library of alexandria being a myth i know you talked about it in your presentation and i kind of mentioned it in passing but if you can give a little bit more context um in terms and also when that historical knowledge came to be i was kind of i was actually fascinated by the scholarship that was done around that yeah, it's actually um, relatively recent, I think. I mean, I remember seeing, you, I don't know if you ever watched Carl Sagan's Cosmos TV show. Mm -hmm. um, so the first episode of that has him um, with the, the the thought experiment, you know, if you had a time machine, where would you go back to? And he said, if I had a time machine, I would go back to the Library of Alexandria the day before the fire. <laughs> and I would rescue all the science that was lost in the conflagration because, you know, look what society could do with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when was that? 1970s, early 1980s? You know, I was a teenager and kind of, watching it with my mum and dad, you know. So not actually that long ago. So it's really scholarship at the end of the 20th and the early 21st century, which has drawn um, a more critical eye on some of the ancient writers who talked about the destruction. Um, but even Edward Gibbon in Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire was very skeptical about some of these accounts of the, you know, these moments of conflagration. And I think what the scholars now tend to think is that there were um, moments where there were fires, where knowledge was certainly lost. And I think the myth of the Great Fire is because there was a rule in Alexandria that any ship coming into the harbour with books, i.e. papyrus scrolls, would have to give them up so that they could be copied in the ancient library. And those scrolls would then be returned to the ship. And there were um, stores of these scrolls kept in the, the docks in the wharves of the, um, the, the harbour of Alexandria, and that it was these stores that were accidentally set on fire during one of the civil wars uh, between Caesar and Ptolemy um, in the, uh, I forget whenever it was, 40, uh, 40 BC. So um, I think that's the, that's the origin. Yeah. That's, that's fast. I didn't realize that. Um, so we're at two o'clock. I think John Bracken is going to jump on to get bear, uh, bid adieu to everyone. Yes. All right. I will. Thank you so much, Jenny, Richard. Um, this was incredibly rich. I want to, I'm sorry, Bob couldn't get in. I do want to acknowledge that one of our board chairs, another board chair emeritus is here with us, Amy Ryan, uh, who, who helped with the formation and really it's leading DPLA. I want to thank Amy for her work. And I know a lot of what we've discussed is relevant to what a lot of her leadership. And Elaine Westbrook, who is from Cornell University and also a DPLA board member presently. And I know at the front line for a lot of these discussions, Richard, that you started to highlight. Um, I, I particularly just want to lean in with the deep by DPLA head on the, the notion that, you know, our work and the technologies we use are not stable, but the tech is constantly changing is something that, you know, I, I think is a really good opportunity and challenge. And 
and if I can channel Bob Darton, it's part of the reason why why he and, and, and others helped birth and create this, this project that we're charged with leading forward now. Um, I, I will plug, and I know Kat, if you've got any links, let, we have got other virtual conversations over the next month or so. For those of you coming to Chicago uh, for AALA annual conference, the DPLA session is happening Saturday afternoon. And you, if you're on our list, you'll get, aha, there you go. You'll get lots of reminders about that. Um, thank you both so much for leading this really rich conversation and for, for spotlighting this work that's so, so poor to, to who so many of us are and what we're doing. Appreciate it, Richard. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed the conversation. Sorry, I uh, not able to do it in person with you all. Um, but um, as I say, thank you for listening. Thanks so much. Cheers, everyone. Have happy summer. <laughs>